Straw Hut Media. So North Star is Marvel's first canonically gay superhero. He is a French-Canadian all-star athlete skier uh, who is famous uh, for a lot of reasons and also gifted with superpowers that have a specific boost when connected to his twin sister. Um, so almost like a, um, a Wonder Twins powers activate, if anyone knows that really outdated reference. Uh, North Star does a lot of really cool things. He's the first character to be subtextually kind of obviously queer. He's the first character to be canonically queer by saying in a comic, I am gay. Uh, and he is the first Marvel comic superhero to um, be allowed to get married to someone other than a woman, uh, which Marvel, to their great credit, um, put front and center after years of again kind of obeying this comics code mentality they published this uh two-page spread of north star's wedding um to a man uh which was landmark at the time this is a character who has super speed um flight uh, a little bit of strength uh, and a few other notable categories um, but to a lot of people the most important thing is just that he's a superhero uh, and for a company that has made a fortune creating paradigms of, you know, heroism for a lot of young people and, frankly, older people as well to look up to. The importance of North Star in the history of representation, of queer representation in media specifically, is landmark. It is absolutely enormous, and everyone deserves to have a superhero. Do not presume to lecture me on the hardships homosexuals must bear. No one knows them better than I. For while I am not inclined to discuss my sexuality with people for whom it is none of their business, I am gay. Be that as it may, AIDS is not a disease restricted to homosexuals as much as it seems at times the rest of the world wishes that were so. Growing up, there weren't a lot of queer fictional characters to read about. As we talked about in a previous episode with Robbie Couch, young adult books haven't always had a lot of representation, and the same is true for comic books. There isn't a character as big as Superman for the queer community to look up to and see themselves in, and there are actual laws to blame for that. It wasn't until the 80s that the Marvel Universe started to introduce queer characters to their stories, and it took another 10 years before any characters were able to fully acknowledge their sexuality and say, I'm gay. Today we're joined by Dr. Andrew DeMann, a university lecturer and comic book expert, to talk about how queerness was introduced into the comic book world, and why many readers don't give comic book creators the credit they deserve. I'm Levi Chambers, and this is Pride. I'm Dr. Andrew DeMann. I am a um, faculty member at the English department at St. Jerome's University on the campus of the University of Waterloo, um, which is a school in Ontario. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, and I am the project lead for the Claremont Run, which was a big comic study uh, on author Chris Claremont. Andrew's passion for comic books, like many readers, began when he was young. I started as a young teenager, I would say. I think I was starting at like, like 13, somewhere in there. But as he began to study and pursue a degree in English, he put the comic books down in fear that reading them would make him look less serious about his profession. And I like regret that so much. Uh, and then I got to PhD school as an American poetry expert, and I was bored out of my mind and just felt like there was nothing new to say and everybody was kind of going in circles. And I was going to quit, which is tough to do when you know, you're an English major and you've gotten that far. There's like a, an escalation commitment. Andrew was feeling uninspired and lost until the very thing that he put away in order to focus on his career would be the thing that saved it. Uh, and I went home for Thanksgiving and I found my old comic book collection and I thought there was some really cool stuff happening there. And that I could be really passionate about and interested in at a time when you know people weren't talking about that. Um, so I, I kind of made that my focus and the university somewhat grudgingly <laughs> allowed me to do that because they didn't have any expertise in comics at the time either. So yeah, that was fun. And then it's been comic scholars ever since. 
A comic scholar sounds like a pretty cool gig, right? But there's still the question of why do people turn their noses up at comic books? What about them seems inferior to the work of Ernest Hemingway or Charles Dickens? It's weird because it's a North American thing. In Europe, it's never been a thing. Comics have always been legitimate. No one, no one questions them uh, the same way that we would um, not question the novel, even though the novel has some dubious origins as well. Um, so I, I think there's weird kind of elitism there. Then, in 1954, a psychologist named Dr. Frederick Wortham published a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which claimed juvenile delinquency was a result of children reading comic books. Much of the science in the book was flawed and unsupported, but the damage had been done. The US government held a trial to investigate if comics were harming children, and the comic critics, they won. Uh, so the censorship bureau kind of made comics awful, and it was specifically tied to queer sexuality at the same time, which is a kind of interesting um, intersectional history. During the battle to censor comic books, Dr. Wortham used violence among adolescents as the base of his argument, but it wasn't his only tactic. There was, as you would know, like in the 1950s, homosexuality was being taken up as a legal issue, uh, and not just in America, but, but kind of everywhere. Uh, and, and comics were subversively queer. Like they always have been. Um, Superman is a naked guy, right? In tights. You just draw little lines on him to make him look um, not naked. But I mean, no human being actually wears tights. Um, so there was um, a sort of niche market that was reading comics in this way. Uh, and there was a very popular underground marketplace for often the same creators doing, like Superman, making fetish art, often geared towards a queer audience. Um, so for whatever reason, um, the guy who sort of orchestrated this, Frederick Wertham, he seized on to these concerns. He was very smart. He, he knew that homosexuality was a panic button that he could press in order to sell books. Uh, and it, it, it worked. Um, even though we know historically now that his, his research is so flawed and based on anecdotal evidence and made up statistics. Uh, and this resulted in a censorship bureau that kind of made comics awful because like, if you look at a list of what you couldn't do under comic censorship in the 1950s, I actually did a study where we ran, um, every single movie from IMDb's top 250 movies and every single novel from Time Magazine's top 100 novels of the last century. None of them would have passed that code. The Comics Code Authority took away all themes of horror, crime, science fiction, and anything else that made the comics enjoyable. They took away all the flavor. It is hilarious. Um, okay, so the Comics Code, you um, cannot talk about, oh, you can't mention drugs. You can't even say drugs are bad because drugs don't exist. You're not allowed to mention drugs. You can't foster distrust of a public official. So you can't have like a crooked cop or anything like that and think what that would mean today. Uh, you can't use the word werewolf in your title. Uh, you can't. Wait, why? Because <laughs> it was Just regarded that the, the EC comics, the horror comics. Yeah, pretty much. Um, there was some targeting of a specific comics publisher who was doing horror comics. So that was in play. Uh, yeah, and um, they, they, they don't actually say, um, they don't say queer sexuality, they don't say homosexuality. What they say is sex perversions. You're not allowed to portray sex perversions, but everybody everybody knew what they meant by that uh so it was which um, actually sounds worse rigid. it kind of does right right like you're almost like just say don't say gay instead of perversions <laughs> like yeah well, I mean, it's, it's an extra little slap in the face too right uh yeah so, so then the comics code was unbelievably restrictive you can imagine what that does to a creative medium that was at its height uh, and as I said, like if you read comics from like 1954 to 1961, they are unbelievably awful. They're just so boring. They're the worst episode of children's entertainment that you've ever seen. Uh, and it's it's tragic because comics were so cool before then, and they've slowly gotten back up there now, which has been kind of fun to see. It's just taking time and it's a lot of censorship to weed through. Yeah, exactly. And like any medium, right? 90% of it is garbage, but the 10% is glorious when you find the good stuff, which is kind of cool. The code's impact ultimately made authors and illustrators reluctant to admit they were working in comics because of the deviant reputation they now had. The number of comics being released decreased from 650 titles in 1954 to just 250 in 1956. 
and it wasn't until after 2011 when all major publishers stopped adhering to the restrictions. My first comic was a Chris Claremont X-Men comic, uh, which is kind of awesome because that's my that's the guy I study, right? That's That's been my big field. Um, and if you've ever read Chris Claremont's X-Men, um, he was doing things subversively with queer sexuality um, that are just legendary. And if you read them now, it is so hilarious that people were not like catching on to what he was doing. Uh, like you, you could say that we're doing some like, like kind of queer baiting stuff or dog whistling stuff. Um, but, but generally speaking, like it, it's a really human portrayal. He, he was embraced by the queer community um, as early as the 1970s at a time when, again, literally illegal um, to have any kind of um, deviant, same-sex, alternative, or queer uh, representation of sexuality in any form. At the time, comics could only hint at a character's sexuality. They couldn't have the character say they were gay or openly be in a queer relationship. They basically were straightwashed. Queer characters existed, but they were subtle, especially for younger audiences. Uh, and then you go back to it as an adult, and you're like, how, how stupid was I <laughs> to, to not pick up on this? Um, which was kind of kind of charming in its own light. Uh, and, and yeah, he, he's been very upfront about it. You, you see interviews with him. He, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, and it, it's kind of delightful. He was informed by things like Wicca, uh, which is okay. a very kind of, um, it, its views on sexuality are very non-normative. Uh, and that led to some, some really kind of cool directions. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, Claremont teamed up with John Byrne, an amazing comic artist, and people fell in love with the duo's work. They created popular X-Men comics, including the Dark Phoenix saga, Proteus, and Days of Future Past. But it was Claremont's not-so-subtle plots that caused Byrne to pull the plug on their partnership. Byrne left the book because he was upset with Claremont's use of what Byrne refers to as, I'm quoting here, sex stuff. Uh, and, and what he means when he says that isn't sex stuff. What he means is he didn't like the queer sexuality. Um, so he departed from, from X-Men and thus ended one of the most famous um, um, writer, author, or sorry, writer, penciler duos in the history of comics. Was Claremont queer? <laughs> okay, so Claremont, hey, what we know, Claremont doesn't talk about his sexuality. He has been asked many times. He doesn't talk about it. We know on the record that he's been married to at least two women. Um, one of them, a probably not confirmed, but we're pretty sure, um, practicing um, Wiccan priestess, uh, a very famous one named Gray Malkin out of New York City. But again, not 100% clear. Um, largely suspected that, that he was certainly active in the New York City kink community of the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, what shape that takes, we do not know. Um, but like, man, I would love for him to write a very honest biography and, and tell us where he was drawing from um, to create these stories that he was creating. Thanks for watching part one of our exploration into the queer history of the Marvel Universe. In part two, Andrew properly introduces the first out gay superhero and discusses Disney's effect on Marvel Comics. Straw Hut Media.